asthma. We're going to talk about pathophysiology and uh, on the, uh, uh, you know, about the anesthesia of the uh, uh, related to asthma. So uh, starting off uh, with the uh, case. So we have a 55 year old man. Uh, he has got history of uh, cholelithiasis and he's scheduled for cholestectomy. Uh, this man has got a, a history of asthma, long, long history of asthma. And very recently, he actually has developed dyspnea on um, moderate exertion. Uh, he uses two pillows at night. And on examination, other than that, there is nothing uh, significant and there is no pedal edema. All his blood uh, seems to be fine. A blood gas was done. And uh, this actually showed a pH of 7.36. PCO2 of 60 millimeters for mercury, so it's raised. A PO2 of 70, which is a little low. And carbon dioxide content is 36 milliequivalent per liter, which is also a little lower on the side. Okay. Just remember this uh, blood gas because we are going to actually, uh, you know, uh, go through this uh, ABG again, uh, um, the big questions. So coming to the first questions, uh, what are the differential diagnoses that are compatible with these uh, symptoms? Okay. So he's got recent, he's got past history of asthma and got a recent history of dyspnea uh, and the shortness of breath on exertion. Okay. So if you look at the differential diagnosis for wheezing and dyspnea, uh, the first thing which comes into mind is bronchial asthma. Okay. Then we can also think of uh, something like uh, acute left ventricle failure, which can also lead to asthma-like symptoms. Uh, this is also uh, called cardiac asthma. There can be causes uh, because of upper airway obstruction. Uh, that can be because of tumors, uh, laryngeal edema. Um, tumors can happen at any age, uh, but they are more common in the uh, older patients. Uh, laryngeal edema is usually uh, because of some uh, allergic reaction or it can happen because of some medications. And the other causes, uh, which obviously foreign body is unusual because of the acute presentation, but uh, neoplasms growth within the endobronchial tree, uh, bronchial stenosis, you will likely have a history. Cosmic tumors can happen. Recurrent pulmonary embolism can also present with wheezing and asthma, like uh, features. Uh, chronic bronchitis, eosinophilic pneumonias, chemical pneumonias, uh, and occasionally polyarthritis can also actually cause these symptoms. But in this case, um, we will be looking at uh, the common causes, okay? And uh, you actually have to remember that three most common causes of chronic cough, uh, which is actually a symptom of asthma, in a immunocompetent non-smoker and someone who is not taking ACE inhibitors. So uh, you know that smokers and ACE inhibitors can cause coughing ACE. The uh, three common causes that can lead to chronic cough is uh, post-nasal drip, asthma itself, and gastroesophageal diseases. Okay. So if you actually look at this, uh, uh, we also look at personal or family history of allergic diseases, uh, which actually provide us a contributory evidence. Uh, long standing asthma can actually progress to COPD, and this can lead to exertional dyspnea and orthopnea. So this is uh, what uh, we were looking at in this case. Has this asthma, long standing asthma, uh, progressed uh, to a chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease in this patient? Now, chronic asthma is a misnomer. And uh, within these patients, if there is a history of cardiac disease, long-standing cardiac disease, uh, which has actually now progressed to left ventricle failure, then on examination, you will find that there's a moist basilar uh, rails. So you will actually on examination auscultation, you see that. Auscultation of the heart will actually show a gallop rhythm. Patient might actually have history of blood thin sputum. And uh, there will be peripheral edema, and there will obviously be a history of uh, cardiac disease. Okay. So before we progress uh, to further on this, it's very, very important to understand the definition of asthma. Okay. So asthma is a disease which presents with wheeze and dyspnea and often with a dry cough. Okay. So wheeze and dyspnea, which is 
caused by reversible bronchial obstruction okay so it is reversible so you use a bronchial uh, sorry uh, inhaler and you can reverse it and the other thing is that this is spasmodic or periodic so there are periods of these uh, uh, you know instances of wheezing and dyspnea and in between patient can be absolutely normal and asthma uh, also has features, uh, clinical, physiological, and pathological features of chronic airway inflammation. Okay. Chronic airway inflammation is part of the asthma definition, and there is increased airway hyperresponsiveness. So anything, any irritant or allergens can trigger uh, asthma. So that's where uh, increased airway hyperresponsiveness uh, comes in. So what is the prevalence of asthma? Now, if you look uh, worldwide, uh, if you look at the prevalence, it's quite uh, prevalent uh, in the uh, uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, so, um, and, and Australia, you can actually see the incidence can be almost as high as 10%. But if you look at the Indian subcontinent, uh, the incidence is around 2.5 to 5% of the population. And it's pretty low uh, in China and in Russia, which is, uh, almost 0 to 2.5 percent and some areas we actually do not have any uh, you know, prevalence data at all. So if you look overall uh, approximately 4 to 5 percent of adults and 7 to 10 percent of children uh, can actually have asthma and it occurs at all ages but predominantly at the early life. So 50 percent of patients who develop asthma they develop it before the age of 10 and another 33 percent of them will develop it before the age of 40 and if you look at the preponderance there is male to female uh, preponderance of two is to one but this seems to equalize by the age of 30 years so childhood asthma like i said the childhood asthma uh, is quite common and the asthma is quite common in childhood and there are certain factors that actually protect against asthma uh, whereas there are others which predispose to asthma and you can actually see that some of these factors are common on both sides so living on a farm right, and in large families uh, tend to protect against asthma childhood infection uh, especially parasitic uh, infection which is actually quite common uh, in the indian subcontinent uh, protects against asthma and predominance of lactobacilli in the gut flora Okay, so using, uh, you know, eating uh, regular yogurt or curd uh, might actually protect against asthma. And exposure to pets in early life, uh, it's like desensitization probably, uh, can also protect. But this happens along with other factors. Because if we actually then go on to the factors that predispose to asthma, you can also see that childhood infection, especially with RSV, respiratory syncytial viruses, uh, can actually cause predisposition to asthma. Exposure to uh, allergens, uh, the house dust mite, household pets. Now pets were on both sides, but I think what we're looking for is that these pets in a clear, uh, very, very clean environment, uh, like in the West, uh, can actually predispose to asthma. Uh, indoor pollution uh, also exposes, and certain dietary deficiencies of antioxidants uh, uh, can also expose to asthma. Exposure of pets in early life, uh, on uh, one side it uh, protects them, but the other it can also predispose. So it's on the both sides of the, uh, you know, the incidence. Okay. So what is the etiology of uh, asthma? So what actually happens in asthma? Uh, we are going to actually look at it into a little bit more of the details. Okay. So asthma are basically two types. Uh, so we have the ectopic asthma, uh, which uh, is also known as extrinsic asthma. It starts early in childhood, and there is a strong family history. The attacks are provoked by immunoglobulin A, and uh, this is like type one hypersensitive reactions to allergens. Allergens like pollens, cats, house mite, dust, danders, okay. So in 25 to 35 percent of all cases there is immunological mechanism and in around one third it can be contributory uh, to this asthma 
The other types is the intrinsic idiopathic or non-atopic asthma. This occurs in later part of the life. It occurs in the middle age. Uh, there is often no family history. It is often associated with chronic bronchitis. And there are often triggers like cold and exercise and exposure to allergens again. So we cannot actually classify this on the basis of immunological mechanism. And this is thought to be because of the uh, abnormality in the parasympathetic nervous system. So there is an imbalance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous system. Okay. But it's not that the asthma has to be classified into one or the other, and there can often be an overlap of the two asthma. And uh, there are other types of asthma as well, which we will actually discuss a little bit more. Uh, so you can actually have occupational asthma, uh, you can have aspirin-induced asthma. Okay. So let's go into further into the pathogenesis of asthma. Okay. So asthma, if you look at it, it is there is airway hyperreactivity. Uh, so there is tendency for the airways to actually contract uh, too easily and too much in response to triggers. And these triggers, which would normally not cause any harm or any effect uh, in normal individuals. Okay. And it appears to be related, although not exclusively, to airway inflammation. So called, there is some component of airway inflammation in these cases. So if you look at the image on the right side of the graph, you can actually see on the x-axis is increasing concentration of histamine. And on the y-axis, we have the FEV1, so reduction in FEV1. The green line actually shows the normal individuals. And you need a very high concentration of histamines to be released uh, to cause bronchoconstriction. But with asthmatic patient, you can actually see as the severity of asthma decreases, you require very little release of histamine to cause reduction, market reduction in the FEV1. Okay. So, uh, there is increased uh, airway hyperreactivity uh, seen in asthma patients. So broadly seeing the two types, the allergic uh, asthma and uh, the idiosyncratic or intrinsic asthma, in the uh, atopic type, uh, there is obviously exposure to the antigens like dust, pollens, danders, uh, lead to release of uh, the immunoglobin E and, and uh, there is release of trigger agents like leukotrienes, CDE. Uh, there's release of histamine, release of prostaglandin F2, D2, G2. Uh, serotonin and bradykinin can also be released. And uh, there's release of thrombraxin A2 and platelet activating factor. Now these uh, uh, you know, mediators, uh, they then actually cause neuro neurogenic reflex through the vagal system. And they can also directly cause hyperirritability and inflammatory uh, airways to respond and cause bronchospasm, uh, microvascular leakage. Okay. And if you look at the uh, other uh, type of asthma, that the idiopathic one, uh, idiosyncratic one, uh, this is because of the exposure to infection, pollution, um, exercise, cold, or uh, the psychogenic uh, part. and. Um, uh, this actually, again, directly stimulates the uh, neurogenic reflex through the vagus system and uh, has caused uh, uh, hyperirritability of the inflammatory airways uh, or cause stimulation of that. And that leads to bronchospasm, uh, microvascular leakage, and uh, increased production of mucus. This is actually going into further details what actually happens at the micromolecular level, okay. So what happens is that the antigens, uh, when they reach the airway, they stimulate the mast cells and the T helper cells. Uh, the mast cells will release uh, uh, histamine and leukotriene, and they will also release uh, certain cytokines. Uh, so the interleukin-4, interleukin-5 is also released. And there is a granulocyte macrophage a colony stimulating factor, uh, which is also released from mast cells and T helper cells. The interleukin-4, and um, this uh, will actually also uh, induce the bone marrow to produce uh, eosinophils. And uh, the uh, eosinophils then travel uh, uh, through the bloodstream 
and uh, uh, why the uh, selectin receptors uh, they get attached to uh, the uh, membrane in the endothelium and then again uh, with the help of uh, certain adhesive molecules that are like the vascular uh, cell addition molecules or intracellular addition molecules uh, ICAM and VCAM and they uh, help in uh, transmigration of these eosinophils uh, into uh, the uh, you know matrix of the airway and when they reach uh, there and there is also again a release of uh, more chemokines and cytokines and these uh, lead to increased survival uh, uh, you know because of the release of interleukin 4 and the granulocyte macrophage chronic stimulating factor so it becomes a vicious cycle so the isnovils like get into the matrix um, and these uh, factors the uh, chemical mediators uh, prolong the action of that that leads to further uh, increase in the release of the substances that can actually cause uh, you know the effects of what are seen in the asthma and this image actually shows what actually happens so here you can actually see that the allergens uh, are stimulating the dendritic cells uh, which release uh, or stimulate the t-helper cells uh, mast cells and neutrophils are also activated eosinophils and there's a lot of uh, these uh, mediators are released and these mediators uh, which are released and they cause the uh, plasma uh, leakage and uh, when plasma leakage occur uh, within the matrix of the uh, you know the alveoli and there is increase in edema there is also increase in the vasodilation uh, and there are new uh, vessel formation uh, so there is uh, angiogenesis and this also actually further increase to the edema formation and the mucus secreting cells are uh, hyper stimulated so there is hyper secretion of mucus so there is increased mucus plug formation at the same time these uh, chemicals which are released uh, they actually uh, also activate the nerve uh, cells uh, which are uh, sensed and then sent through the cholinergic system the vagus nerve and these itself will act on the smooth muscle cells and they will uh, produce bronchoconstriction hypertrophy hyperplasia of the airway smooth muscle cells so you can actually see that so there is a chronic inflammation uh, there is edema formation um, and there is increased hyper responsiveness okay, to uh, the allergens uh, in asthma okay. so uh, the other other factors uh, which uh, we need to understand is this is because of the newer agents uh, for treatment of asthma that has been actually released into the market uh, so we know that the aspirin excise allergens, cold air, platelet activating factor, uh, sulfur dioxide kind of uh, the uh, pollutants, they all stimulate mast cells and eosinophils, and these can actually stimulate the arachnoidic uh, acid, uh, uh, you know, metabolism, and uh, there is increased formation of uh, cysteine leukotrienes, the leukotriene C4, D4, E4. And this occurs in the presence of 5 lipooxygenase or 5LO. 5LO is 5 lipooxygenase. So if you can actually use uh, 5 lipooxygenase inhibitors like uh, Zalutone, uh, this can actually help in asthma patients. Then this system leukotrins uh, also actually have receptors on eosinophil, uh, on the smooth muscles, on the mucus gland, and on the, uh, on the uh, cells of the vessel, vessels and uh, this actually uh, it is here that uh, leukotrin antagonist actually acts so this uh, once you might have heard of uh, montelukast and uh, pranflucast and zephyrlucast uh, these are the drugs which actually help and stop the release of uh, these mediators and help in asthma so this is how they work this is where they work uh, okay so what are the predisposing factors for asthma attacks we have already actually seen that so these uh, stimulants or can be airborne allergens uh, like the dust or mites or danders um, cat hairs dog hairs okay and they can be pharmacological stimulants uh, like aspirin uh, coloring agents uh, uh, like you know hair colors uh, tetrazine um, uh, beta blockers non-specific beta blockers okay uh, can also uh, be pharmacological stimulant. Sulfiding agents are important, and we will discuss that because if your thiopentone has got sulfur, 
uh, non steroidal agents, anti inflammatory agents, uh, you know, the uh, used for painkillers, and uh, they can also predispose to asthma in this particular group of patients. Okay. And now, environmental air pollutants uh, are also uh, the big triggers, and they are actually asthmas, which are based on the cities. Uh, these are cities uh, which are heavily industrialized and have a dense urban population. Uh, so there are asthma named after uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, and New Orleans uh, asthma. So these are two asthma which are actually named after the cities. Interesting, isn't it? The occupational uh, uh, factors, and uh, there are actually um, industrial compounds that can trigger asthma. Uh, so these are actually named after them. So we have uh, meat wrappers asthma. So in meat wrappers asthma, they use uh, these PVC films. Uh, which are actually heated up and when they are heated they release uh, uh, the uh, you know triggers the uh, these are called uh, uh, phthalic uh, and anil uh, anildride anildride yeah uh, phthalic anildride uh, which can trigger asthma in that then uh, in baker's asthma they are exposed to a lot of things that are exposed to flour uh, grains uh, additives and the used in the uh, uh, breads and baking items and the enzymes there are various enzymes uh, egg powders uh, yeast okay and nuts <laughs> and they can be dust obviously there so uh, these all can trigger uh, asthma in bakers so this is called baker's asthma uh, woodworkers asthma is because of the composite dust that is produced uh, uh, when these uh, are working on uh, the uh, uh, wood machines and uh, uh, you know while sanding uh, you know, making the surface smooth, sanding, so that leads to a lot of dust production. So that can also trigger asthma. So you can actually see asthma in these group of patients. Infection, we have discussed that uh, respiratory syncytial virus uh, is actually an important factor. In some exercise, actually can induce uh, asthma. Okay, and uh, uh, it is made worse uh, by physical exertion. And in some patients, emotional asthma. So you can actually see that patients get emotional and the asthma is actually triggered in them. Okay, so uh, that can also trigger asthma. So what is the universal finding in the arterial blood gases during asthmatic attack? Is it a hypoxia you see, or you see CO2 retention? And which one is more common in that? So we know that carbon dioxide actually has got greater diffusion capacity, which is almost 20 times uh, more than the oxygen, okay. So, uh, in asthma, it is more of hypoxemia, uh, which is a universal finding. Okay. So frank ventilatory failure with CO2 retention is uh, relatively uncommon. Okay. So what we see during asthma is that, especially during acute attack, patient will try to hyperventilate. Okay. And I have explained this in my other lecture, uh, where you know uh, the uh, you know uh, the gas equation. Okay. So that is important uh, for that. And uh, uh, if CO2 is actually reduced, that will improve the oxygenation. And they also hyperventilate <coughs> to overcome airway obstruction and hypoxia. So this hyperventilation can lead to hypocarbia and respiratory al alkalosis. So if you actually see a CO2 retention <coughs> in an asthmatic finding, this is often a late finding. And this always says that there's a severe and prolonged airway obstruction. Uh, so you can actually see this in patients with the status asthmaticus uh, where the patient are now tiring down. They're not able to hyperventilate. The muscles are fatiguing. Okay, in those cases, you would actually see CO2 retention. So, but otherwise, in asthma, CO2 is usually normal. And if you actually see CO2, uh, increase CO2 in patients, uh, then you can actually start thinking, of, has asthma actually progressed to COPD? So what is the preoperative workup? Uh, what do you order in a patient uh, who has got asthma? Okay. So the pre-op work, the goal of the preoperative evaluation is to actually formulate an anesthesia plan and that prevents or blunts the obstruction to expiratory airflow. That means it prevents any chances of an asthmatic attack. Okay, so that's our main idea. So that we want to look at is everything normal? Okay, so this could actually include routine tests. Uh, we would actually look at complete blood 
count like in this we might want to actually see if there is actually increase in the eosinophil counts in these patients we look at serum urea and electrolytes it's important especially if you're looking at uh, you know something like magnesium is actually very important levels of magnesium we actually look at urine analysis we do a ecg we do a coagulation screen okay these are routine tests which we would do but we would also like to do some cardiopulmonary function tests or look at uh, the chest x-ray of the patient uh, pulmonary function test of the patient and see how they've been responding to bronchodilators and maybe do a, a baseline arterial blood gas to see what their normal PO2 and CO2 are. Now again, uh, history is equally important, history of allergy. What induces uh, asthma, what, what triggers the asthma in these patients is actually important to know. So like you might actually have patients who actually have allergy to uh, say peanuts or to uh, soya bean and stuff like that or to egg. Okay. And the other thing is we also look at uh, symptoms and signs of chronic or respiratory failure. Um, and this is important, especially in long-standing asthma patients or patients who have developed core pulmonale and right-sided failure because of long-standing, or patients who actually progress to COPD. Okay. Coming to uh, some of the interesting part of asthma, uh, we'll be talking about the lung volumes, lung capacities, okay, and the flow volume loops. So that is a normal uh, spirometric um, thing. So um, graph, uh, we at least look at uh, normal respiration, ask them to take a deep breath, looking at the inspiratory capacity, ask them to breathe out completely, looking at expiratory capacity back to. So in the black is normal, uh, the uh, uh, you know spirometry. Uh, on the top in the green, uh, we have patients who are COPD and. Uh, and this is uh, patients or COPD asthma where there is increase in the residual volume. And lower part, you can actually see that they look like normal miniaturized uh, spirometry. This is uh, seen in patients uh, with restricted lung disease, uh, like in pulmonary fibrosis. Okay. So when we look at a normal spirometry, uh, we are actually talking about four volumes and four capacities. So some of them are normal. So normal tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled or exhaled during normal breathing. And the normally we have 450 mLs or approximately this comes to 6 to 8 mLs per kilo. Then we're looking at the uh, inspiratory reserve volume. And this is the maximum volume of gas that can be inhaled after normal inspiration. Okay. So you can further, you have a capacity and this comes to around 200 to 3, uh, sorry, 2,000 to 3,000 ml. So almost 2 to 3 liters. So beyond 500, we can actually breathe in an extra 200 to 350 ml uh, more, 2,000 to 3,000 ml more. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of gas that can be exhaled after a normal expiration. Okay, so you're taking a deep breath and then you breathe out. And uh, after the normal listening, then you can have to breathe out another 1,000 ml. Okay, so that is expert reserve volume. A residual volume is whatever is left after you have completely emptied your lungs. That's the beyond your capacity. Okay. So whatever uh, capacity remains within the lung, that is the residual volume. Okay. So capacities uh, is actually more volumes. Volumes added together form capacities. Okay, right? So we actually have seen that the vital capacity, vital capacity is basically your normal tidal volume, which is 500. Inspiratory reserve volume, which is around two liters to three liters. And expiratory reserve volume, which is one liter. So if you combine together, uh, this comes to around 4.5 liters. Okay. So that vital capacity is normally around 60 ml per kilo. Inspiratory capacity is basically uh, your uh, tidal volume plus the inspiratory uh, reserve volume. And uh, this, you can see, so we have total volume of 500, inspiratory uh, reserve volume of around uh, 2 to 3 liters. So this is approximately 3.5 liters. And then the functional residual capacity, this is the uh, volume remaining in the lung after normal respiration. Okay, not after a forced expiration. Uh, this is after a normal uh, respiration. So what is left after a forced expiration is the residual volume. 
But if you actually add the residual volume to the expired reserve, uh, reserve volume, that is a functional residual capacity. Uh, we know that the functional expired reserve volume is around uh, uh, one liter. Uh, residual volume is around, uh, uh, you know, uh, around uh, 1.5. Uh, so the normal uh, functional residual capacity is anywhere from 2.5 liters to 3.3 liters uh, in uh, healthy adult patients. If you add all the volumes together, that obviously is a total lung capacity. And total lung capacity is around five to six liters. It matches your uh, cardiac output, which is around five liters per minute. So that's where ventilation perfusion matching actually occurs. <clears throat> this is uh, a, another nice way of representing this. On the left side is what we actually have uh, normally seen. On the right side is a, another way of looking at uh, uh, these things. So uh, if you look at uh, in the uh, red, that is the uh, your uh, reserve volume. Um, and reserve volume is around, like I said, 1.2 to 1.5 uh, liters. And then uh, blue is the uh, volume uh, which you're breathing through. So if you actually are able to actually take a deeper breath uh, beyond the total volume, okay, so that uh, part uh, that becomes your inspired reserve volume and when you actually breathe out completely uh, that actually includes your expired reserve volume and the uh, residual volume uh, plus the expired reserve volume and uh, that makes up your functional residual capacity okay and uh, okay so <clears throat> what are the changes uh, are seen in uh, spirometric lung volumes and lung capacity uh, during an asthmatic attack. So when you're looking at the asthmatic attack, obviously there is uh, now uh, the uh, airways are now uh, obstructing. Okay, so there is a decrease in the internal diameter of the airways. Okay. So you're not able to breathe out completely. So the forced vital capacity and um, this might remain normal or may reduce. But the FEV1, so the forced expiratory volume is markedly reduced. So this is uh, reduced, uh, uh, and this is almost 50% of the force vital capacity, or it could be less than 40% of the predicted FEV1. So uh, it could be, uh, you know, if you one is like uh, three liters, it'll be 40% of three liters. But if you look at the mid uh, maximum mid expiratory flow rates, uh, these are the parts which are flow independent and the maximum breathing capacity. So number of uh, breaths you can act take as uh, rapidly as possible within a minute. These are markedly reduced. And I will tell you what the volumes for these are. So normally the maximum uh, mid expiratory uh, flow rate is around 300 liter per minute. And maximum breathing capacity is around 125 liter per minute. Okay. So these are reduced. There is reduction in the expiratory reserve volume. Okay, but the residual volume actually increases by almost 400%. Now, why is it increasing 400%? That's because every expiration, you're not able to empty the lungs completely. So every you know, breath, there is actually uh, the residual volume keep increasing. And uh, even though the expiratory reserve volume is reduced, and uh, the function residual capacity actually and total lung capacity increases uh, because there is market increase in the residual volume. So residual volume has increased by uh, Four hundred percent of the normal, and hence, this is actually, uh, you know, increasing further and further. Okay, so functional residual capacity has actually increased. So, what are flow volume loops? And um, so, we need to actually think uh, how we draw these flow volume loops in healthy subjects, uh, in a in a COPD patient, and in a patient uh, with restrictive lung disease. Okay, so we're going to look at that. So flow volume loops are basically graphic analysis of flow at various lung volumes. And so you are actually recording both the volume, the flow and volumes uh, on an XY recorder, uh, while the patient is actually asked to breathe in to the total lung capacity, and then uh, do a forced vital capacity maneuver. Okay. And so we will actually look at it, how it is actually done. So uh, these are the uh, FE1 and the uh, flow volume loops uh, the blue one is for tracheal uh, obstruction. You can actually see uh, because the obstruction is at the uh, uh, level of the trachea. Usually, this is looking at uh, uh, you know extra thoracic obstruction, 
Uh, green one is for COPD patient, and the orange one is for uh, a patient with pulmonary fibrosis or restricted lung disease. So when you look at the restricted lung disease, it's what is happening in the uh, usually the chest wall. Okay, so there is restrictive uh, changes happening in the wall or within the lungs as well. Whereas in the obstructive, uh, there is narrowing of the airway. So when the patient is trying to actually breathe out, uh, there uh, the expiration is prolonged. So F1 is actually increased, uh, sorry, reduced rather. It takes long time for the expiration to actually happen. Uh, in the obstructive lung disease. So this is a normal, uh, your, uh, uh, the flow volume loop. And so what we're going to do is actually from the, uh, you know, zero, uh, so the residual volume level, uh, we're going to take a deep breath in. And this is uh, followed by uh, expiration. So, okay. So first is the, the bottom part is the inspiratory part. So from zero, uh, to the uh, total lung capacity, okay, so, and then you breathe out as rapidly as possible, so, okay, so there's rapid expiration, okay, so uh, the expiration is in the first uh, uh, second is the FE1, and uh, the ex rest of the uh, the forced expiratory volume, and that is uh, uh, the 25, 75 to 25 percent is uh, effort independent, okay, and then we take a breath again, uh, okay, and complete this loop, okay. So uh, this uh, expiratory volumes at, uh, or the expiratory flows, uh, force expiratory flows between 75 to 25 are considered as uh, flow independent. Now, if you look at flows at 50% or the mix, these are called uh, mix, mid uh, water capacity flow ratio, you can see they are equal in the inspiratory as well as expiratory. So this is they're very, very important. So the ratio um, uh, at uh, the 50% uh, or mid uh, water capacity flow ratio is always one in normal patients. So if you look at the restricted lung disease, everything is like a miniaturized normal volume. Okay, So it's miniaturized and it is shifted to the right. So this happens in patients like with the pulmonary fibrosis or scoliosis. So the airways, there is no problem with the airway. Airways is normal. They're not hyperreactive. Uh, they're not edematous. Okay. So they are actually shifted to the right. And uh, so in these cases, uh, there is reduction in the forced vital capacity. Uh, but the FE1 is normal. Uh, total lung capacity is shrunken. So it is, it is reduced. And the forced expiratory flows at 25 to 75%. And the mid vital capacity ratio, all normal. So uh, mid vital capacity ratio is 1. And the force expiratory flows uh, between 25 to 75% is normal. The FE1 is, is normal. So that is the your restricted lung disease. But if you look at the obstructed lung disease, uh, the shift is towards the left. Okay, the residual volume is increased. Okay, the, there is uh, increase in the residual volume. And uh, because of that, there's an increase in the... Uh, uh, you know, the capacity of the uh, total lung capacity. Whereas if you look at the peak expiratory flow rates and uh, look at the FE125 to 75%, and if you look at the mid uh, vital capacity flow ratio, these are all reduced uh, in that because the expiration is actually limited. Okay, there is slowing down of expiration because there is narrowing of the airways. Okay, and so FE1. Uh, is reduced, uh, mid expiratory flow is reduced, uh, mid vital capacity flow ratio reduced. Okay, except that the total lung capacity because of the increase in residual volume is increased. So you have a like a barrel chest. Okay, the diaphragm may push down the lungs, the air, the uh, chest looks looks you know with that. That is uh, a graph um, uh, flow volume loop that looks for tracheal stenosis. What is important to understand here that the tracheal stenosis it depends uh, whether it is intrathoracic or extrathoracic. Okay, so the graph will actually change. Uh, the flow volume will loop will change according to the uh, type of uh, tracheal obstruction and what level it is. Okay. So what are uh, closing capacities and closing volumes and what are the normal values uh, for this closing volume? 
So closing capacity is a lung volume at which small airways in the dependent part of the lungs begins to close. Okay, so this is very important and we'll discuss the importance of this. Okay, so small airways begins to close. And closing capacities, like I've said, capacities is basically uh, two volumes, so two or more volumes. So closing capacity is basically closing volume and the residual volume. So that is volume of the lung, which is actually left after a normal, you know, expiration. That is the residual volume. Okay. Uh, closing volume is difficult to, uh, you know, we do not, we cannot measure the closing volume uh, using normal spirometry. You need to actually use a single breath nitrogen test. And uh, I'll show you how uh, that looks like. Okay, so uh, if you actually have to uh, know what is the closing volume, you need to actually do a single breath nitrogen test. Okay. So this is a single volume or the, uh, what do you call, single breath nitrogen test. And we have to look at the phase four. If you look at it, this actually looks like exactly like your ETCO2 graph. Okay, but instead of actually measuring the carbon dioxide, we are now measuring uh, the nitrogen concentration in the breath. So in the phase four, what are you looking at? That the closing volume actually starts, that is the beginning of the uh, phase four, and where it ends, uh, that volume is the closing volume. So closing volume can only be measured using uh, the nitrogen concentration, okay, or single breath nitrogen test. So what are these effects of age and posture on the functional residual capacity and the closing capacity? So functional residual capacity is mostly independent, but if you actually have to look at it very closely, there is actually increase in the uh, you know functional residual capacity, but it is very small. It is 16 ml per year. Okay. And uh, this happens because of the loss of elasticity of the lungs, uh, especially the alveoli. Okay. Whereas the closing capacity increases with age, and this is very, very important. So we need to actually look at the ratio of the closing or the relation between the closing capacity and the functional residual capacity. So the closing capacity will equal the functional residual capacity at age of 44 in the supine position. But it actually uh, is equal at age of 66 even in upright position. So if you look at patients uh, who are supine and you make them upright, the functional residual capacity actually increases by 30%. And that's why uh, when we are waking up the patient from anesthesia, you want to have them sitting up because that increases the functional residual capacity and that actually improves the oxygenation of the patient. Okay. So the impo importance of the uh, closing capacity and the functional residual capacity we have seen that at the age of 44, uh, with lying down, the closing capacity approaches the functional residual capacity. That means that a small part of the lungs will start collapsing as they lie down. That means they will actually develop atelectasis, basal atelectasis, just by lying down. Okay. Whereas, if you look at patients uh, at 66 years, I tend to actually remember yeah, 45 and 65. One year here, here and there doesn't make much of a difference. In at age of 66 years, the closing capacity approaches the functional residual capacity. That means that even in the sitting up position, certain parts of the lungs will start collapsing, that there will be a lactis, a lactis in the base, basis of the lungs, uh, uh, even in the sitting position in these elderly patients. Okay. So it's very, very important that if you are anesthetizing patients uh, above the age of 45, you need to actually start applying the, the PEEP uh, to keep the alveoli open and prevent further atelectasis because once the atelectasis start, they will keep progressing again. So the closing volume is uh, approximately 10% of vital capacity and we've seen that vital capacity, which is basically uh, your tidal volume plus the inspired reserve volume plus expert reserve volume, Altogether, that is around 4.5 liters, and 10% of 4.5 liters is around 40, 450 mLs. Okay, so it's around. That's why 
the closing volume is around 400 to 500 ml. Okay. And we also seen that closing volume actually increases in patients who have small airway disease and uh, in patients who are chronic smokers. So these patients will start developing basal atelectasis uh, just in the lying down position. Okay. How would you uh, uh, differentiate between obstructive lung disease and uh, restricted lung disease uh, using spirometry? Okay. So this is an important uh, question for the postgraduates asking the exam all the time. So like I, like I have explained, restricted lung disease is just like having a miniaturized normal lungs. Okay. So this is seen in like patients with pulmonary fibrosis and closing spondylitis. Okay, patient with uh, kyphoscoliosis. So there is a limited expansion of the lungs and chest wall, which leads to decreasing the forced vital capacity. The airway resistance in the normal, there is nothing happening within the airways. The airways are not narrow. Okay, so the forced expiratory volume is not reduced proportionately. So if you look at the ratio of FE1 by FEC, this could be normal or even increased. Okay, because and the FE1 is actually reduced a bit, but the forced vital capacity is normal. So this can actually lead to increase or normal uh, in the, uh, you know, the ratio. Whereas in the obstructive lung disease, uh, like happens in the patient with asthma, emphysema, COPD, airway resistance is high. So you are not able to breathe out easily. And because of this, there is market reduction in the FE1 by FEC ratio. The maximum breathing capacity and the maximum mid expiratory flow rates are also reduced uh, uh, early in the small airway obstruction disease. Okay, so uh, these are also uh, reduced. Like I said, the MBC is around 125 liters per minute. This probably will reduce to almost 40 percent, and and the maximum mid expiratory flow rate is around 300 liters per minute. Uh, this will be reduced to almost 100 liters per minute. So uh, there is marker reduction in these. Okay. Uh, so uh, maximum mid expiratory flow rates. Uh, so we look at the. Uh, this is basically looking at the forced expiratory uh, flows between uh, 75 and 25. Okay, so reduction between 25 percent to, sorry, 75 percent to 25 percent of the expiratory time. Okay, when it happens, that is the forced uh, expiratory. So like I said, normally it is around 300 liters per minute, and this is markedly reduced in restricted lung disease. Uh, maximum breathing capacity is the how fast you can actually breathe in a minute. Okay, so rapid breathing that is uh, 125 liters. So it calculates all the volumes over the minute, and that's why it is 125 liters uh, per minute. Okay. So if you look at uh, this more graphically between the two obstructive and restricted lung disease, and in the first graph you actually see the forced uh, expiratory volume in uh, one minute. Sorry, one second is almost four uh, liters. Uh, forced vital capacity we normally know is around 5 liters and so ratio of the FE1 by FEC that is 4 by 5 is around 80 percent. If you look at the obstructive lung disease so we know that FE1 is uh, is markedly reduced uh, so this is reduced to 1.3 liters uh, whereas the forced uh, vital capacity is reduced but uh, not to that great extent. So if you look at the forced vital capacity in uh, the obstructive lung disease and the obstructive lung disease, both is same. Whereas if you look at the FE1 in the restricted lung disease, it's almost normal. Okay, so normal for that amount of reduction. So if you look at the ratio FE1 by FEC in obstruction, uh, the, here it becomes 1.3 by 3. That is almost a 42% reduction. Okay, uh, so that's 40% reduction. From 80%, it has become 40, 42%. But in other extreme lung disease, you might actually see that the ratio is actually more than normal. And that's because the FE1 is actually, is in relation to FEC, is actually pretty high. So it's 2.8 over 3.1, which are almost 90%. Okay. So normally FE1 is greater than 80% of forced vital capacity, that is seen on the left side. And uh, vital capacity should be more than 80% of predicted value in normal patients. So anything below this is considered as abnormal. Okay. This is just looking at the same thing in a tabular form and uh, describing that with in terms of post-vital capacity, uh, total lung capacity, 
uh, residual volume, the ratios, and the maximum uh, mid expiratory flow rates, uh, which are reduced in obstetric lung disease but are maintained in restrictive. Uh, maximum breathing capacity is reduced in obstructive lung disease, but it's normal because, like I said, restricted lung disease is just like being having a miniaturized lung, which has been shrunken. Normal lungs have been shrunken. A DLCO is not used normally to differentiate between obstructive uh, disease and restricted disease, but in patients uh, with asthma, which has progressed to COPD, you can actually see reduction in the uh, DLCO. So that is the uh, diffusion limit. Uh, for carbon monoxide, okay, that is reduced uh, in the COPD patients. Uh, that is asthma progressing to COPD. So, what are the effects of anesthesia on functional residual capacity and closing capacity? Okay. So, we know anesthesia changes uh, uh, the chest wall shape and the diaphragm position. It obviously depends whether you have used muscle relaxants or not and whether they are packs when the abdomen or not. So after induction of general anesthesia, there is reduction in cross-sectional uh, area of the rib cage. So this leads to reduction in lung volumes to almost 200 ml. And there is cephalon movement of dependent region of the diaphragm, and this can reduce uh, functional residual capacity by around 30 ml, which is not a great amount. So if you look under spontaneously breathing patient, functional residual capacity is reduced by 20%. And uh, artificial uh, breathing or uh, ventilation reduces by 16%. Uh, so the closing capacity is reduced in parallel to functional residual capacity during anesthesia. And as I have already explained, that the closing capacity can approach the functional capacity pretty early on a lying down position in patients uh, who are above 45 years. And even in sitting position in patients who are above 65 years. So there will be some atelectasis happening uh, because of the closing capacity encroaching onto the functional residual capacity and causing collapse of the dependent uh, uh, airways okay, at the bottom. So atelectasis will be increased uh, in these patients. And why is functional residual capacity important in oxygenation? We all know about this. Uh, so we actually have seen uh, that functional residual capacity uh, when it is uh, less than closing capacity, then airway in the dependent part of the lungs will start collapsing, and this will lead to increased shunts, okay. and this will lead to uh, arterial oxygenation. So maintaining functional residual capacity uh, by maintaining the positive and expiratory pressure uh, improves oxygen. Okay. And this is the same thing explaining, uh, I've already shown the first graph where the closing capacity is encroaching uh, the uh, uh, FRC uh, at 45 in lying down position and 60 uh, and at 65 in sitting position. And, and there is on the right side, it shows uh, how there is vested uh, uh, you know, circulation. There is uh, uh, atelectasis, so uh, there is venous increase in the venous admixture. Mm -hmm. So are there methods of measuring functional residual capacity and closing volume? Answer is yes, but in normal uh, situations, this can't be measured by uh, spirometry uh, measurement. They need special measures. So functional residual capacity can be measured by helium dilution technique. It can be measured by single breath nitrogen washout test. It can be measured by uh, body plethysmograph. Uh, whereas the closing volume is uh, determined by uh, mainly two techniques, that is a single breath nitrogen test, uh, which I actually showed the graph for that, and by bolus technique using inert traces of gases like helium, xenon, or argon. Okay, so these are the diagrammatic uh, representation. Uh, this is the helium dilution test. Okay, so known concentration in a volume. Uh, okay, this is again uh, at equilibration; it is measured. Uh, so concentration in V1 into concent uh, volume of V1 will be equal to the con uh, concentration in C2 into the volume 1 and volume 2. So from this, uh, we can make out uh, what the uh, uh, total lung capacity is, or functional residual capacity is. Uh, this we have already seen. This is a single breath nitrogen test. And it is at the phase 4 where we can actually start seeing the uh, increase in nitrogen uh, as the lungs parts are collapsing. Okay, so. 
And this is a body plethysmal graft. This actually uses a Boyle's law, which actually states and that the product of pressure and volumes are constant. Uh, so when the uh, volume is reduced, the uh, pressure increases, and this can be uh, measured. Okay, or if you increase the volume, the pressure will reduce. So this is the our uh, whole body plethysmal graph. Then uh, there is xenon um, uh, radiation counter, so we can actually measure uh, the closing volume from this uh, at various well, lung capacities. You can also use helium, you can also use uh, uh, argon for this. Okay. Uh, equations for shunt and uh, the dead space. Uh, these uh, postgraduate should know how to uh, derive. And if you look at the uh, diagrams from this, you can actually see and uh, that the ratio of the uh, uh, QS by QT, that is the equation for shunt, is equal to the uh, CCO2 minus CaO2. Uh, CCO2 is in capillaries, A is in the arterial blood, uh, minus CCO2 uh, uh, minus the uh, CBO2 is the venous blood. Okay, uh, so this is the uh, shunt equation, and we normally have around 4 to 5 percent of the blood is shunted normally. And you should also know the dead space equation, that is the Vd by Vt ratio, which is equal to PaCO2 by PeCO2 by PaCO2, uh, the alveolar uh, to arterial. So alveolar, uh, the carbon dioxide is equal to the CO2. So the entire CO2 can be taken as equal to uh, the PeCO2. And PaCO2 is, me uh, is measured from the uh, blood gases. So normal, uh, the uh, ratio of uh, the shunt equation uh, gives us that the normal shunt is around 4 to 5% and the uh, dead space to total volume ratio is actually 0 0.3. Uh, we know that the normal uh, dead space ventilation around 150 mLs and the total volume is 500 mLs. So if you look at the ratio 150 by 500 is 0.3. So it's easy to actually calculate that. So this was the blood gas of the patient uh, in this case. A uh, patient has a pH of 7.36, that actually says that there is acidosis. And it shows that PCO is 60 millimeters mercury, so we know that it's raised, so this is respiratory acidosis. Uh, PO2 is 70 millimeters mercury, that means there is hypoxia. Uh, CO2 content is 36, we know that that is reduced. Okay, so this patient must be hyperventilating. So that means there is some amount of respiratory compensation in this. Okay, so. Uh, this we are assuming that this is a, a blood gas taken at patient breathing 21% uh, oxygen, that is the uh, room air. So uh, this blood gas is basically showing that there is mild hypoxemia and respiratory acidosis, and this is compensated uh, by metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so this picture actually shows that the uh, patient is actually developing COPD, and that's why there was a history of that the patient actually is becoming more dyspneic and having uh, some amount of dyspnea on exertion. Okay, so uh, this patient was, he's a long-standing uh, asthmatic, uh, which is now progressing to uh, the COPD. So what is your preoperative preparation for asthmatic patients with COPD? Okay, so preoperative uh, uh, goals. So we're coming, coming part to the anesthesia part now. Uh, first thing is the eradication of uh, acute or chronic infection uh, with antibiotics. We know that infection can cause exacerbation or asthma. Uh, we need to ma make sure um, that uh, the patient is optimally bronchodilated. Okay. We need to make sure that the patient actually has regular physiotherapy and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, good amount of sputum clearance and bronchial drainage. Uh, this is because there is increased amounts of mucus production in uh, uh, COPD and in asthma patients, as we have seen. And if there are any signs of core pul uh, pulmonale uh, because of the long acting uh, asthma and patient progressing to COPD, and then we might actually want to actually start the patient on diuretics and improve his oxygenation and uh, correct his acidemia. If this patient is smoking, so history of smoking is very, very important. We ask him to start smoking. Ideally, it should be stopped smoking for two months. And that's only when you actually have improvement in mucociliary clearance and there is a reduction in sputum production. 
short-term reduction or, or stoppage of uh, uh, the smoking can actually cause bronchorrhea and increase production of sputum. Okay, it won't be as uh, viscous as the uh, one seen in uh, normal conditions, but you can actually see bronchorrhea. So even if the patient are not able to stop smoking for two months, so there is no time for that, uh, stopping smoking for two days or almost 12 hours reduces the carboxy hemoglobin level. And this can help in increasing the bredoxin content and release of oxygen in the hemoglobin. So it'll be useful. So preoperative preparation will include that there should be continuation of prophylactic chromolin glycate inhalation if they're using so because chromolin glycate is a mast cell stabilizer and this will reduce the release of histamine because of exposure to anesthetics. Uh, we should correct any dehydration or electrolyte imbalances which might be present. We know that beta 2 agonists can cause hypokalemia, so that's why it's important to know the electrolytes. And uh, if the patient's uh, been uh, on uh, steroids, uh, uh, we might actually want to uh, continue that. And if they have got uh, ongoing uh, wheezing, that is they're not well controlled, we might actually want to increase the steroids or introduce steroids in these patients. They should also be uh, you know, familiarized with respiratory therapy, which might be required for post-operative period. Okay. And so, for example, if the patient actually had a upper respiratory tract infection, how long would he postpone the elective surgery in these cases? We know that uh, acute respiratory infections can actually lead to acute exacerbation of asthma. And uh, viral infections increase the airway responsiveness. So there is chances of at least uh, triggering asthma or bronchospasm. And this can last for almost two to eight weeks after the infection uh, subsides. This happens even in, in healthy patients. So just not on in asthmatics, uh, even in uh, the normal subject, the airway hyper-responsiveness actually remains. Hey. So Cohen and Cameron, they actually reported, this is in children, that uh, upper respiratory tract infection and endotracheal uh, anesthesia can increase the risk of postoperative pulmonary complication by almost 11 fold. So there is increased risk of respiratory complication in postoperative period. And at eight and nine, they actually found that laryngospasm and bronchospasm uh, was increased even in healthy children two, uh, two weeks after the upper respiratory tract infection, uh, you know, has been treated or has subsided, the symptoms have subsided even after that. So it is recommended uh, that even after the clinical recovery from the upper respiratory tract infection, we wait for two to three weeks. Okay. Uh, so in, in asthmatics, uh, that is very, very important uh, because they already have increased uh, airway reactivity or hyper responsiveness and uh, this will further increase that. So increase the risk of the uh, your asthmatic attack. So what medication would you expect a patient with asthma to be in and how or where do they actually work? So this is a nice diagram which actually shows all the components of asthma. So briefly describing what exactly happened in asthma and where do the uh, medicine act. So if you actually look at the the management of asthma, which itself is a big topic. There are two types of actually inhalers most of these patients use. They fall into two categories. They are either relievers or they are preventers. Okay. So relievers are, are, are usually short-acting uh, yeah, beta-2 agonists. Uh, so you're looking at uh, salbutamol, uh, uh, terbutalin, and they might be actually long-acting as well. Uh, so Saba and Lava, they are called. Uh, some patients can be on uh, muscarinic antagonists like teotropium. And uh, like I said, there are newer agents uh, like the leukotrin D4 antagonist, like uh, Montelukast, and that's quite common. Some patients might be, uh, these are especially the atopic uh, uh, patients, uh, they may be on chromoglycate. Uh, chromoglycate is a mast cell stabilizer and prevents release of histamine. Then preventers mainly are actually corticosteroids. So they can be uh, inhaled corticosteroids like butosinide and uh, beclomethazone. Or in acute cases, we might, patients might be on prednisolone. So normal, normally when patients actually have acute exacerbation, 
then they are actually put on oral dose of uh, the prednisolone. So uh, this one actually helps. There can be other causes for uh, you know wheezing and uh, like in patients. So we we'll look at that patients uh, who have hay fevers, uh, they can be on antihistaminics as well. And then anaphylaxis, obviously, that is uh, uh, mostly happening acutely. Uh, so those treatment is slightly different. So where we use epinephrine and steroids and uh, antihistaminics, uh, we're not talking about those ones today. So basically, these are the two inhalers uh, which all patients to count should uh, actually be having. So on the left side is a blue one, which is salbutamol, and on the on the right side is steroids. Okay. Uh, so uh, one is a preventer. So the right one is a preventer, that is the steroid inhaler. On the left side is the reliever. So this can be used acutely. Uh, patient has acute attacks, then you just take the salbutamol. Okay. Otherwise, they need to be on a steroid inhaler, which should be that one. So would you use preoperative steroids for asthmatic patient listed for surgery? And if you're going to use it, why? Okay. So this comes to the fact that, uh, you know, um, that normally uh, in stress, we only release around 30 milligrams of steroids. Okay. Uh, so, pardon, so that's the normal, but in stress, uh, we tend to release as much as 200 to 500 milligrams of steroids under stress. And we also know that exogenous steroids can uh, cause the suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Okay. And that's the reason why we might need to actually give steroids. So it has been seen that the patients who are prescribed steroids uh, which is equivalent to prednisolone of more than 5 milligrams per day in adults or equivalent to hydrocortisone of around 10 to 15 milligrams per meter square per day in children. And this does not matter how these steroids are given, whether given orally, uh, uh, inhaled, they're used topically uh, as creams, uh, used intranasally like patients uh, uh, with hay fever, or has been used uh, even uh, intraarticularly, like the patient persons, the orthopedic guys actually inject uh, steroids into the joints. And so all of them can suppress the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Okay. So use of steroids in any form is the most important cause for adrenal, in, uh, adrenal insufficiency that we will encounter. That means that there can be severe hypotension on induction of anesthesia or during stressful situation under anesthesia. Okay. So these patients can become like hype, uh, unresponsive or hyperresponsive to your use of your uh, vasopressors. Okay. So steroids are actually important. This history of uh, how long the patient has been on steroids, uh, how long uh, or what doses they use so we can actually see that patients who actually have uh, severe asthma, they might be actually using a lot more steroid uh, than, than normal patients do, okay, or the milder cases do. And that amount of steroids may be enough to suppress the HPAA axis. Okay. So that's important to know how many doses of inhalation they're taking. So in poorly controlled asthma, uh, it's very, very important that we supplement a patient with some steroids and the usual dose is 40 milligrams once a day uh, for five days okay and if the patient are not able to take uh, oral steroids then we can actually go for hydrocortisone and this is 100 milligrams every eight hourly okay. once the patient actually comes to theater we can either use uh, IV hydrocortisone 100 milligrams at induction or if you're not able to uh, give hydrocortisone, 68 milligrams of dexamethasone uh, provides good cover for almost 24 hours. Okay. If you have to, have to follow up uh, this with infusion, then the dose is 200 milligrams in 24 hours uh, till the patient cyclically can take oral steroids. And normally the doses are tapered uh, within 48 hours, uh, but in certain cases, we might actually have to taper them over a week. 
In patients who do not have IV access, you can actually also use IM uh, steroids can be used. So recently, the Anesthesia uh, Journal actually published uh, the uh, use of steroids, supplemental steroids. Uh, this came out in February this uh, year. And uh, these are not, there are not much changes in what we already know. So for minor procedures or surgeries under local anesthesia, uh, you, the patients can take their usual steroids, so whether it's in inhalers or oral, and they do not require any supplementation. But in patients who are undergoing moderate surgical stress, uh, like the surgeries on the lower limb, uh, revascularizing procedures, total arthroplasties, they need to take their normal dose of steroids, and we also provide them 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone IV uh, just before the procedure, and continue with 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone every eight hours for 24 hours. So you give them, provide them 24 hours uh, thing, and after that, patients should be able to resume on their normal steroids. But for major surgical procedures like you're doing, uh, uh, you know, upper GI surgeries like esophageal gastrectomies. Uh, or major lower uh, GI procedures or so open heart surgeries, then in these cases, patients take the normal steroids, but we also supplement with almost 100 milligrams of our steroids, hydrocortisone, before induction, and then continue with 50 milligrams every eight hourly for 24 hours, and then taper uh, dose by half per day uh, to a maintenance dose. Okay, so it might take longer uh, for that, so we need higher doses for major surgeries. Okay. So what is the onset of action of intravenous steroids in therapy in asthma? We know it that it is not immediate. It takes almost six to 12 hours. So they are not used for treatment, but these are for uh, you know stabilizing the patient, okay, so that they don't have further attacks of asthma. Okay, so uh, severe asthma will not be uh, you know terminated uh, by use of IV steroids. Okay. So if you're going to give steroids in a severe attack, we're going to give hydrocortisone 4 mg per kilo. And this causes the plasma cortisol level to be more than 100 mg per deciliter. And this is followed by 3 mg of kg uh, per kg every 6 hours. Okay. We can also use methylprednisolone. Uh, this is usually given in the dose of 60 to 125 mg every 6 hours. Okay. So methylprednisolone can also be used instead of hydrocortisone in these patients. But don't expect them to actually be working immediately. This is more for uh, stabilization uh, so that no further attacks occur. Uh, Simetidine, we don't use this nowadays, but this is of historical importance. Uh, Simetidine uh, is a H2 receptor antagonist. Okay. And we know that the histamine mediates uh, bronchoconstriction through the histamine receptor, H1 receptors. And uh, you know, if you block the H2 receptors, then you are actually unmasking the H1 receptors. So it can actually potentiate uh, bronchoconstriction. Okay. Also, uh, simetidine is actually cleared very slowly, especially if you're using theophylline. Now, theophylline is again one of the agents which actually has gone out of fashion uh, because it's got a very narrow uh, therapeutic index. So. Uh, cardiotoxicity was actually quite common with theophylline with patients actually having severe arrhythmias. So that is also gone. So this is the time when we were using theophylline and using simetidine uh, for uh, both of them not good agents. Okay. So would you premedicate the patient uh, uh, coming for surgery who is asthma and how are you going to do it? Okay. So obviously, uh, premedication should include uh, patients' uh, usual bronchodilations. So they can actually use uh, their multi-dose inhalers or powders. And this, this is given 20 to 30 minutes uh, before you anticipate airway manipulation. So that is 20 to 30 minutes before uh, your intubation. Not that, you can also actually give the patients uh, these inhalers, uh, you know, just before your uh, induction of anesthesia. But it's better to actually give them 20 to 30 minutes before so that they are already working. Uh, sedative and opioids, you need to be careful and they need to be titrated. And uh, normally reassurance, explaining the procedure, what are you going to do? Explanation is usually enough. Okay. But if you are going to perform some painful procedure prior to anesthetic induction, for example, if you're going to place an intraarterial line or epidural catheter, then you can actually give uh, midazolam in small increments. 
or you can actually give small doses of fentanyl, 25 to 50 micrograms of fentanyl. Do you give patients uh, anticholinergics like glycoperlotropin to dry the secretion? Well, it depends. Not everybody believes in it. So they do dry the secretion, but they also reduce the airway uh, vagal responses. So in patients who can tolerate tachycardia or dryness of mouth, you can actually use glycoparolate or atropine as part of pre-medication. So what is the advantage of using atropine in asthmatic patients? I've already actually explained that it does cause dryness. And uh, so that's why some people actually think it is contraindicated because it can cause plugging and it can actually trigger the asthmatic attack. But this is all very theoretical. Okay. Uh, atropine actually blocks the uh, formation of uh, cyclic guanine monophosphate. Okay. And that means that will increase the amount of cyclic AMP um, within the system and increased cyclic AMP uh, causes bunker dilation. So it can. And it has been seen that uh, if you actually give uh, atropine as in line uh, as a nebulizer it actually improves f1 by it um, uh, improves f in, in almost 85 uh, percent of patients with copd okay and that's why i think um, aprotropium which is also anticholinergic is actually works in copd patient atropine obviously is not the best drug to use uh, but aprotropium bra is actually a good drug uh, in copd patient so if a patient actually has a severe asthmatic attack in the operating room before induction or anesthesia, uh, would you pay for the patient to sleep or postpone the surgery? I think this uh, question is about basic, uh, uh, you know, common sense. Okay, so first thing is, if the patient actually actually had an attack about, you know, before induction, you would actually relieve uh, the, uh, you know, the bronchoconstriction or the bronco asthma need to be treated, okay. And uh, if it is an elective surgery, you can actually think of postponing and uh, re-evaluating. Is it possible that patient who is not, uh, you know, optimally bronchodilated? Is it possible that patient actually is uh, uh, developing a recent infection, chest infection, uh, which might have caught exacerbation? So you need to actually look at it properly. But if this is an uh, is in an acute emergency, like for example, this is acute appendicitis and the surgery actually has to go on then you actually can you treat the asthma uh, once the uh, you have terminated the attack of asthma by various agents then you can actually think of actually uh, going ahead with the surgery and continue with your medical treatment later on uh, <clears throat> so if the this doesn't didn't happen so this was a hypothetical situation but it didn't happen and uh, you are able to actually induce anesthesia, how would you do that? Uh, would you use a supraglottic device uh, instead of an endotracheal tube? Do they actually, supraglottic device have an advantage over endotracheal tube? Okay. So for induction of anesthesia, the, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, three principles. Um, basically, you want to block the airway reflexes before laryngoscopy intubation. Uh, you want to ensure the uh, airway smooth muscles are relaxed and you want to prevent further uh, release of mediators that can cause uh, a bronchial constriction. Okay. So it's important that uh, before induction of anesthesia, you can ask the patients to take two to three puffs of his, uh, the inhaler, MDI. Yeah. Um, if you're planning for uh, endotracheal intubation, okay, so uh, we can actually use adjuvant uh, medications like opioids. Uh, we can give uh, 50 to 100 micrograms of fentanyl. Uh, you can use uh, lignocaine, one to 1.5 milligram lignocaine can be given, and uh, along with the neuromuscular blockade. Okay, so these will actually help uh, to prevent the uh, irritation uh, caused by endotracheal tube. Okay. Uh, Profol is the best agent uh, for induction of anesthesia and the other agents which we can use is etomidate and ketamine. And there's a newer agent, dexmedomidine. Well, it's not a new agent anymore. Uh, a lot of people are using it, uh, unfortunately, in UK and US. Uh, this is not a cheap agent. It is very costly. Uh, but I think in the Indian subcontinent and other places, people have extensive experience with dexmedomidine 
probably one of the best agents for asthmatic patients. Why? Okay, so uh, dexmedamine, as we all know, is alpha-2 agonist. And in patients uh, who are planned for spontaneous ventilation using LMA or just holding a mask, and uh, this agent provides analgesia. It's a good sedative. It's a good anxiolytic. Uh, it's uh, got sympathetic properties. Okay. Uh, slightly uh, disadvantage might be that this can cause bradycardia, but if you use it properly, it's not a problem. You can combine with uh, agents like ketamine, so it actually forms a good agent. Uh, it also causes drying of secretions uh, without respiratory depression, so you don't actually have to use anticholinergic with dexmedomidine. And most importantly, it protects against histamine-induced bronchoconstriction. So if there are other agents uh, uh, given uh, that can induce histamine-induced uh, bronchoconstriction, uh, dexmedomidine actually uh, prevents that, so it protects that against the uh, histamine-induced bronchoconstriction. Uh, so a wonderful agent to actually use. Uh, what about uh, neuromuscular blockers? Okay, uh, so uh, this is considered as one of the important causes of reaction, allergic reaction or anaphylaxis uh, uh, is caused mainly by neuromuscular uh, blockers. Uh, but if you look at uh, the uh, histamine release uh, that happens uh, with these agents, uh, of these is stratocurium, vacuronium, and rocuronium uh, are preferred over uh, sexamethonium and atricurium. Uh, sexamethonium is actually pretty safe. The release of histamine is actually very, very low, so it's been safely used in asthmatic patients. Atricurium, again, in the clinical doses, it does not release as much histamine. Uh, it only releases histamine in very uh, high doses. So bronchospasm, again, is uh, not very common even with uh, the uh, use of atricurium. So coming to LMA versus endotracheal tube, uh, so uh, can we use that? So goals of induction of anesthesia is to uh, minimize risk of bronchoconstriction in response to airway manipulation. And risk of bronchospasm is always lower with uh, laryngeal mask airway or the supraglottic devices or just by holding a mask uh, on the face. Okay, But the decision whether you need to use a supraglottic device under trickle tube should be no different okay, than that uh, in a normal patient or a patient who does not have asthma. Okay, So the decision should not be based on the disease. It should be based on the indication. So uh, in the in the uh, trials, it have seen that uh, the airway resistance, which happens, okay, the looking at the airway resistance, it's only in the first ten minutes that there is a difference between the airway, airways, the that is the LM and the endotracheal tube. After ten minutes, uh, once the, the tube is in or the supraglottic device is in, uh, after that there is no difference in the airway resistance uh, in either of them. The other thing we need to be very careful is. Uh, uh, doing the airway suction okay, in patients. Airway suction can be uh, irritant and can uh, uh, cause uh, bronchoconstriction. Uh, and so if you actually have to do airway suctioning, it should be under deep anesthesia, not in a light plane of anesthesia. Uh, this is another historical question. Uh, why was methoxidant preferred over thiopendone in the past? And I'll just explain to you uh, when we are talking about etiopathology, the sulfur atoms, sulfur are considered to be uh, bronchosulfite and sulfurs are causes bronchoconstriction. And we know that uh, thiopentone actually has got a sulfur moiety in it. And it was thought that it is the uh, that thiopentone, the sulfur in the thiopentone, which methoxidone doesn't have, which triggered asthma. But actually that's not a fact. The fact is that the depth of anesthesia achieved with thiopentone is actually not that great because it redistributes uh, very, very quickly. Okay, so it's a redistribution, the uh, you know, depth of anesthesia is reduced and the patient might be in a lighter plane of anesthesia when you use thiopentone. So thiopentone uh, itself may not be responsible for it. Uh, what do you use profoetomidate or ketamine for induction? We have already said that. The best agent uh, for induction is Profol, and uh, it att attenuates the bronchospastic response to intubation in both asthmatic and non-asthmatic patients. So I think that is the best uh, agent uh, for trachea intubations. 
<clears throat> the other thing is that uh, uh, so there have been some some uh, uh, allergic reactions reported with Pro4, and this was supposed to be due to the uh, preservative uh, that is sodium metabisulfate, which might be present in them. So otherwise, this is a, a Pro4 is a very safe agent in asthmatic etomidate. It, it uh, this is not got as good bronchodilatory properties as Profol, uh, but it is useful in patients uh, where there may be a compromise of the hemodynamics, so unstable patients uh, can, can be used. Uh, ketamine, uh, ketamine uh, uh, does also produce uh, bronchodilation. Uh, this is thought, uh, thought to be through the neural mechanism uh, as well as through the release, indirect release of catecholamines. Uh, so, in actively wheezing patient, uh, ketamine can be a good agent uh, of choice. Uh, it can also be very useful again in patients uh, who are hemodynamically unstable. Okay, but if you compare uh, Profol and ketamine, uh, Profol actually uh, has got a better bronchodilation properties than uh, ketamine itself. I know it's surprising, but it's true. And uh, would you use Lignocop for intubation? Yes, IV lignocaine can be used uh, during intubation. Uh, it uh, prevents the reflex uh, induced bronchospasm. Okay, uh, but uh, the other thing you need to avoid is, is to actually do a endotracheal spray. Okay, you can use it as a nebulizer. So if you want to nebulize the airway, that's fine. But don't try to actually you know just spray the larynx. Uh, this spray itself can actually induce bronchoconstriction. Uh, lidocaine can also be used as infusion of one to two milligram per kg per hour. Uh, this is very useful in patients, uh, cardiac patients or patients COPD, or when you want to use this uh, for as adjuvant to analgesia. So it's a uh, part of multimodal analgesia. It can be used. Now, if this is an emergency surgery and rapid sequence induction is indicated, how would you induce anesthesia in this patient? Okay. Uh, so it's important that we would actually take all the precautions as we would uh, for rapid sequence induction. Uh, we would ensure that uh, we would actually use uh, denitrogenation. Uh, we would uh, uh, make sure that the lungs are actually full, uh, filled with oxygen. And as far as rapid sequence uh, uh, and taking intubation is concerned, we can use Profol, thiopentone, sexamethonium, and sexamethonium for intubation. Uh, most importantly is that you don't allow aspiration. Aspiration itself, any amount of aspiration uh, can uh, trigger asthma bron or bronchospasm. Uh, ketamine can also be used in patients uh, as well. And uh, it itself also is a bronchodilator like explained. So uh, you can use ketamine uh, as well. So you don't use uh, in asthmatic patients who might also have uh, ischemic heart disease or cardiac disease, uh, it's important that we actually use uh, fentanyl. Uh, so up to five micrograms per kg uh, can be used two to three milligram, two to three minutes before induction. And uh, this will suppress airway airway reflexes and prevent tachycardia and hypertension caused by intubation. Again, lignocaine can also be used. Uh, one to two milligram per kg can also be uh, given. Uh, along with the fentanyl, uh, okay. So this will also prevent reflex bronchospasm in emergency situations. So these are useful uh, techniques that can be used, okay. And uh, the patients can be full stomach, make sure that uh, this is actually emptied. And we already said that you can denitrogenate. And uh, for as far as uh, uh, sexamethonium can cause uh, muscular fasciculation, muscular fasciculation and uh, a mild histamine release and uh, precurization using suscepticulinum vacuronium uh, one milligram three minutes uh, before sexamethonium can also be used and if the patient has a wheezing attack of anesthesia you can actually use inhalation of uh, short-acting bronchodilators like uh, salibutamol and we'll discuss this in a little bit more de details so what is your choice of anesthesia for maintenance? Sorry, what is the choice of agent for maintenance of anesthesia? Obviously, uh, volatile anesthetic agents, all volatile anesthetic agents uh, of up to one to one MAC uh, are good bronchodilators, okay, whether it's sevoflurane, halothane, isoflurane, even desflurane for that matter. Okay, desflurane uh, can be irritant. Uh, it is uh, not as sweet smelling as other agents. And um, 
Uh, people say that because it is a pungent smell, but then you're not going to use it for uh, induction of anesthesia. So maintenance of anesthesia, you can use dust fluorine as well or rice fluorine, not a problem. All of them actually have bronchodilate property. Uh, what is the mechanism of bronchodilate property? It is increasing the cyclic AMP. Uh, and so the uh, increase, uh, all these agents act via the beta adrenergic receptors, uh, increase cyclic AMP, and this promotes uh, the uh, smooth muscle relaxation. Okay. The other th important thing is that uh, increase in the cyclic uh, AMP uh, impedes the antigen antibody uh, mediated enzyme production of uh, histamine release. So it reduces, uh, these agents also reduce uh, histamine release as well. Uh, through the increase in cyclic AMP. So uh, very good. So volatile anesthetics obviously are uh, better, better, uh, okay. Uh, as far as uh, volatile anesthetic versus uh, intravenous is concerned, uh, we know that uh, certain agents are bronchodilators. IV uh, profile is a good agent. Uh, they can be used as part of TVA. Uh, Cadmium uh, is also causes indirect bronchodilation and that can be used, but if you're using morphine, okay, uh, pethidine morphine, they can release histamine and they can cause bronchoconstriction. Whereas uh, fentanyl, alfentanyl, these are actually, they're fine. They do not have any significant effect of the bronchial tone. Okay, uh, so yes, they can be used. Uh, intravenous agents can also be used. But overall, uh, water anesthetics actually have a better uh, you know, uh, bronchodilatory property. What about regional anesthesia? So are they better? Okay, of course, regional anesthesia is a good choice because you are not manipulating the airway. Uh, so they can be considered to be actually safe, but you need to actually uh, have certain safety features in mind. So if you're using uh, neuroaxial anesthesia, uh, you do not want uh, the, uh, you know, the high spinal anesthesia reaching uh, the, uh, you know, above, uh, the uh, T4, uh, so causing uh, the bradycardia hypertension, uh, or further than that, uh, causing paralysis of accessory muscles of breathing. It's not that that itself will cause problem. That is that patient actually have this sensation of not being able to breathe. Okay, and this can provoke anxiety, and anxiety itself can pro provoke uh, bronchospasm. So either when you're using it, be careful with what level you are achieving or also have patients some amount of sedation uh, so that the anxiety component can be taken care of in these patients. Certain blocks, especially like uh, if you have interscaling blocks, uh, you know, they can, uh, uh, the local anesthetic can seep over to the uh, phrenic nerve, uh, block the uh, diaphragm, supply to the diaphragm. And again, it can actually cause respiratory compromise. Patient can become very anxious. Despite the fact they are maintaining oxygenation, they can actually feel that they are suffocating, unable to breathe, anxiety, again can trigger that. So again, be careful of uh, what approach you're using in these patients. Okay. Uh, the advantage general anesthesia has is that you actually got a control airway. You can uh, you know, deliver uh, whatever amount of oxygen you want. Uh, disadvantage is that the endotracheal tube itself can be a stimulant for triggering, uh, uh, you know, bronchospasm, especially in lighter pain of anesthesia because they are irritants. Okay. Uh, which muscle relaxant would you use? I have already said that most muscle relaxants are safe. Uh, some of them can release, uh, like uh, articulium, uh, can release uh, histamine uh, when used in higher doses. Uh, rocuronium has been known to release uh, histamine and cause bronchospasm. Uh, 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 Sexamethonium uh, can release histamine, but it's very small amount, uh, so pretty safe. And uh, mevacurium only in high doses. Okay. Now reversal of uh, the uh, uh, muscle relaxation. So they are colonist traces. Okay, so they can perspirate through muscarinic receptors. They can perspirate, but we never use anticholinergic trace on their own, so they are safe. So if you look at these steroidal uh, compounds, pancuronium, vacuronium. Procurium, they are pretty ugly sterile, they are actually safe. Uh, Cisatricurium is a purer form of reticurium, uh, again, doesn't release that. But mevacurium, atricurium, they only release histamine at uh, very high doses. Okay. 
So what would you do if the patient developed bronchospasm in the middle of the surgery? Okay. Uh, so the signs of bronchospasm under anesthesia, uh, it could be vason auscultation. Uh, it could be change in the enteral CO2. You can actually see the slope increasing, upsloping of enteral CO2. Or they can miss a, a, a decrease with their severe bronchospasm. The tidal volumes can reduce. Inspiratory pressures can go up. A patient can desaturate. Uh, CO2 levels can come down. Okay, so uh, management is first rule out uh, the non-bronchospastic causes. Okay, look at all the circuits. Look at other causes. Uh, increase the FI to 100%. Hand ventilate to see uh, what the compliance is. Okay, the compliance in bronchospasm is actually reduced and you can actually see the exhalation is actually prolonged so you might actually have to change the way you're uh, ventilating the patient okay. you also need to actually rule out the other causes that may mimic uh, bronchospasm like endobronchial intubation has the tube moved in okay is there a pneumothorax because of the high pressures used during intubation has the patient developed pulmonary edema is there a kink or obstruction to the endotracheal tube? So just pass the catheter and see if there is the passing it quickly. So rule out these uh, things that can mimic that. Anaphylaxis is another cause of bronchospasm and you need to actually see if the patient is also dulling hypertension, tachycardia, or there's a rash. Okay, so rule out. So in these cases, adrenaline will be your uh, drug of choice rather than actually using just the bronchodilators. So management includes that you actually ventilate the patient with 100% and ventilate them. Uh, if it is mild bronchospasm, you just deepen the anesthesia with bolus or ipropofol. You can give ketamine or increase the volt anesthetic concentration. But if the bronchospasm persists, then you can have to use short-acting beta-2 agonist uh, by nebulizers, by connecting it to the breathing system, or by MDI through the endotracheal tube with an adapter. You need to give around eight to ten puffs, okay, because there can be condensation of the uh, you know the agents uh, in the tube endotracheal tube. So you need to actually give eight to ten puffs of the uh, bronchodilator. In severe bronchodilation, okay, uh, adrenaline can be used, uh, especially if there is a component of anaphylaxis or histamine release. Uh, you can give 10 to 50 microgram IV bolus and uh, continue with uh, infusion of 2 to 10 microgram per minute. Very rarely used. Uh, magnesium sulfate is uh, one of the, the commonly used uh, drugs. Uh, but again, yeah, this should be actually come later on. Uh, you can give 2 grams IV over 20 minutes. And this has been proven to be very useful in acute exuberation. But also be mindful that high doses and uh, increased blood levels of magnesium can cause uh, skeletal muscle weakness and CNS depression. Uh, they can cause uh, reduction in systemic vascular resistance. Uh, this can cause hypotension or delayed awakening uh, in the post-operative period. Uh, we have explained that uh, uh, high doses of steroids can be used, so you can actually give hydrocortisone 100 milligrams methylprednisone, 60 to 80 milligrams. Uh, it takes four to six hours to be effective, but what it's doing is that it is actually uh, taking care of the later part, uh, prevention of uh, the bronchospasm in the later part of the thing. They also help in stabilizing the mast cells, so they are actually, and reduce their airway edema as well. So uh, they're useful uh, uh, to give, and you need to actually continue with that. The uh, role of anticholinergic is, uh, again, uh, it depends. Uh, you can actually use glycopyrrolate, atropine, but more commonly we use ipratropium if the patient is already on. You can use that my, uh, as a nebulizer, 500 micrograms or 0.5 milligrams can be uh, nebulized, or you can also use the meters dose inhalers. Uh, four to eight puffs through the endotracheal tube can be used. Okay. Uh, onset is delayed, it takes 20 to 30 minutes to actually take effect. Okay, and uh, hence, if this is normally combined with something like salbutamol. And you should expect uh, tachycardia uh, with the uh, use of ipratropium because it's an anticholinergic in the end. Okay. The other interventions uh, which are not much useful but are mentioned in the literature are nitroglycerin, uh, thinking that this is a direct smooth muscle but doesn't help uh, cause hypertension. Heliox use is limited by the use of that the FI2 is only 21 to 30%, so not very useful. Uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, this is only when 
it is a terminal event, so you're not able to break the spasm, then you can actually take patient on the uh, uh, bypass. Okay. And if the patient does not uh, respond to all your efforts, uh, what do you do? You need to do a blood gas, get a blood gas, find out what's going on. If there's severe acidosis, in that case, whatever you are giving may not actually work. You might actually have to give some sort of bicarb uh, to uh, correct the acidosis. And you can actually see that uh, once the acidosis is mildly treated, then or you take care of the bronchodilators might work better. At the same time, you might actually have to call someone else for help. You might actually have to actually get help from your critical care uh, colleagues or from the uh, pulmonary uh, pulmonologist uh, actually because if the patients you're not able to break the spasm then better get help from the seniors okay so one of the differential diagnosis of intraoperative bronchospasm you go from systematically from the tube make sure the tube is not kinked there's no endobronchial uh, intubation uh, make sure there is no, nothing in the uh, tube there's no aspiration and uh, there's no secretions of blood uh, rule out that there is no pulmonary edema, there is nothing fine frothy secretion in the tube. Uh, rule out that there is no pulmonary embolism. This would be not be easy, but by exclusion. And make sure that the patient has got uh, enough uh, neuromuscular blockage uh, on board. Uh, sometimes coughing on the tube itself can initiate uh, the bronchospasm. And uh, also patient breathing against uh, the tube, closed tube, can actually cause negative pressure uh, pulmonary edema. So all that need to be ruled out in that. So finally, you were able to release the surgery completed. Do you want to reverse then? Emergence from anesthesia is equally important. Uh, bronch uh, spasm can occur with reverse of uh, neuromuscular blockade okay, because patients, uh, you actually stop the anesthesia, patient can become light. Uh, there can be airway obstruction, laryngeal spasm, inadequate ventilation and hypoxia can occur uh, because of the uh, patient actually trying to breathe, inadequate ventilation, uh, uh, irritation leading to bronchospasm. So the goal is to actually achieve a smooth control emergence. Okay, and how do you actually do it? Okay, reversal, you would reverse with neostigmine, uh, which itself causes bronchial uh, constriction, but they are never given on their own. You always, uh, give neostimine along with glycopyr atropine and these take care of the muscarinic receptors so they block the muscarinic receptor uh, which uh, initiate uh, bronchospasm so pretty safe to actually give uh, the reversal but if you are lucky and if you are working in a, a rich institute then uh, you can also use uh, Sugamedex and uh, this en encapsulates uh, the muscle relaxant and then uh, is executed renally. Uh, but there are reports of uh, bronchospasm from the use of Sugamedex itself. Okay, so uh, use with caution in asthma, so not the uh, the panacea. Okay, you can uh, give uh, uh, you know bronchodilators through the endotracheal tube directly. You can give IV lignocaine, uh, one to one to two milligram per kilo. Okay, and get the patient in the head up position and uh, allow the patient to waken up uh, uh, without the irritation from the endotracheal tubes. Okay. Uh, you can also do it uh, in deep plane of anesthesia, but that need expertise, and I was going to talk about this later on in a lecture. Okay, And be sure that there is no contents in the stomach. So, uh, you know, aspiration during, uh, during emergence is actually quite common and anything which is aspirated into the lungs can lead to bronchoconstriction. And these are different ways in which you can actually give, uh, you know, salbutamol, you can uh, give through a special connectors uh, on the endotracheal tube. Uh, you can uh, also actually have use a 50 ml syringe and then I can attach a, uh, you know, long dilators uh, through which uh, you can actually uh, give, you know, once you press the plunger on, and that presses uh, the you know, top of the uh, your inhaler and you're able to actually deliver that. Now again, remember, you need to actually not just give one or two puffs. Uh, you need to give at least eight, eight puffs, okay? So four to eight puffs um, because there will be some amount of the loss of the uh, agents on the endotracheal tube, okay? And this is again showing uh, directly 
attaching the uh, syringe. Uh, so instead of actually having the connector uh, directly in, into the endotracheal tube or uh, having a, you know, uh, creating your own uh, kind of uh, connectors like T-piece connectors uh, to the uh, endotracheal tube. So there are many ways which have been described uh, where you can actually deliver um, the anesthesia, uh, sorry, the bronchodilators directly to the patient. Uh, when the patient cannot be extubated early in the recovery, how would you keep the endotracheal tube in place without causing bronchial constriction? Uh, like we said, a slow emergence is the technique. Um, so you can give a uh, loading dose of lidocaine uh, followed by continuous infusion. Uh, you can give beta-2 agonist as we have just described. Also, alternatively, you can replace uh, the endotracheal tube uh, with a laryngeal mask airway or supraglottic device of your choice. Uh, but be sure that the patient is not full stomach and the airway is not compromised. So this can also be used. Uh, there's other techniques. Uh, how do you decide uh, what the post-op course of the patient is going to be um, uh, after emergence from anesthesia? So it is the intraoperative course uh, that determines uh, uh, what the postoperative course is going to be. Okay. So if there was a uh, patient had adequate pain relief, bronchodilation, uh, can do uh, uh, incentive spirometry, or um, uh, deep breathing exercises, okay, then early mobilization are important in avoiding uh, post-operative complications. So you actually extubate them uh, as, as you would normally. Uh, so uh, so post-operative management of asthmatic patient is similar to that of the non-asthmatic, but if and uh, there has been severe bronchospasm during the anesthesia part, then you might want to actually postoperatively ventilate the patient, allow time for maximum medical treatment, uh, allow for return of airway function and recovery from the neuromuscular blockade without use of reversal, because some people like say, they're not happy to use reversal in these cases. In certain cases, non-invasive ventilation can be beneficial for these patients after extubation. So how will you manage the post-operative pain control for in these patients? Uh, so if you actually have epidural, use it. Uh, it reduces splinting antilactases, and this helps in normalizing the respiratory muscle function. Okay, uh, you can also use nerve blocks like intercostal or parietal blocks in patients uh, where you cannot actually place epidural catheters. You can use abdominal blocks. You can use, uh, you know, catheters, uh, surgical catheters. Uh, implanted in the abdominal wall. Uh, there are different ways. So combine, combine regional anesthesia with that again. Uh, you need to be careful with non-steroidals because they can, uh, in a prescript, acute bronchospasm in almost 8 to 20% of cases. And uh, so we actually uh, better to use simple analgesics like paracetamol, IV by oral tramadol, uh, lignocan infusions in these cases. Okay. So uh, with this, we will end our lecture and uh, thank you for listening to the lecture.